Hi, everyone. Today, we will continue our topic of transients in power systems by looking at a particular class of transients known as switching transients. Uh, in general, power systems are stable. However, they are not static, meaning that as things change, for example, loads are switched on and off, lines are switched on and off, or cap banks or transformers are brought online or offline, the operating condition of the power system changes. The change from one operating condition to another does not happen smoothly. Typically, this happens through a transient, a high-frequency oscillation in voltage and current and frequency while you go from one operating condition, which is stable, to another stable equilibrium. Uh, during these events, the electric energy stored in capacitors um, is exchanged with magnetic energy stored in inductors and vice versa. Um, and this process continues. And of course, it damps out because of the inherent resistances we have in the system. Uh, fortunately, we have enough resistance to uh, damp out these oscillations fairly quickly, uh, which is usually within one cycle of power frequency, one cycle of 60 hertz. Uh, these events are high frequency. Depending on the event, um, you may experience something in the range of tens to hundreds of hertz all the way to tens or hundreds of kilohertz. We're going to start the discussion by looking at uh, the most common switching event in distribution systems, that is switching on a single capacitor bank. Let's consider a scenario in which I have a voltage source that represents my power system um, that is connected to a particular cap bank. So this is L of S, which is my source inductance, and this is my uh, capacitor. Um, as we have seen before, the moment that I have a switch and I close this switch uh, to connect the capacitor to the rest of the system, I will have an oscillation and the voltage of the capacitor, as we saw last time, follows the form of V, uh, which is the voltage of the system at the point of switching, minus the difference between the system voltage at the moment of switching and the initial voltage of the capacitor times cosine of omega zero T, where omega zero in this case is one over square root of L of S times C. Uh, usually these events are high frequency enough that allows us to assume that the voltage of the system during those transients remains constant. This is why, um, despite the fact that the voltage is a sinusoid at 60 Hertz, I'm considering it a constant value. Uh, the other interesting observation as we talked about it last time is that the magnitude of oscillations essentially is the difference between the system voltage at the moment of switching and the initial voltage of the capacitor, which as we saw last time, if uh, the capacitor is switched on at the moment, the system voltage is the same as the voltage across its terminals, we're not gonna see any transients. Now, what happens is when you um, make the contact between uh, the switch terminals, the capacitor essentially pulls the system voltage to its own voltage, initial voltage of VC0, and then starts an oscillation around that particular point. Uh, imagine if this is my time, and, and let's say my system has a sinusoidal waveform like this, and this is the moment in time that I uh, connect the capacitor. And for the sake of this example, let's assume that the capacitor has an initial voltage of zero. So this would have been the continuation of the system voltage if there was no capacitor switching. But because there is capacitor switching, the system voltage is going to be pulled to the voltage of the capacitor. And then you will have an oscillation around that point until it damps out. Uh, this, of course, is a you know exaggerated version because the frequency is pretty high. So if you look at it on an oscilloscope, you're probably going to see a bunch of, you know, spikes like this. A more interesting event happens when we have back-to-back -back capacitor switching. Back-to-back -back capacitor switching occurs when you have one capacitor connected to the system already, C1, 
and then you want to switch on a second capacitor, in this case, C2. Now, usually we switch on or off capacitor banks when the system current is at zero. This reduces uh, a lot of the current transients, but because the system is very inductive or very capacitive, depending on which one has a larger size, when we're talking about zero crossing of the current, um, essentially the voltage is gonna be very close to peak value. In this particular example, because this is a purely inductive or purely capacitive circuit, again, depending on which one is a larger value, Cs or the Ls, uh, regardless, when the current reaches zero, the voltage is going to be at peak, either positive peak or negative peak. So let's assume that I'm closing this switch at the zero crossing of the current. Zero crossing of the current is situation where the current that is flowing through the inductor is going to be zero. So if the current is zero at that moment, I can assume that the portion of the circuit on the left-hand side is irrelevant. There is no current flowing through it. Hence, it is as if it is not connected to the rest of the system. Of course, you understand that this is a very short period of time, but because we're analyzing fast transients, we can make that simplifying assumption. So on the right side, I have developed an equivalent circuit for this um, particular network. Um, I have the source voltage V of S. I have L of S, which is the source inductance. I have the two cap banks. Um, for the sake of completeness, I have added two kind of stray inductances, L1 and L2, in series with them. And then I have L of B, which represents the inductance of the bus bar that connects capacitors one and two. Um, again, because the switching occurs at zero crossing of the current, it means that I1 is zero. So I can assume that the left side is disconnected from the right side. I have modeled it using this fictitious switch of S of S. So essentially what I have is I have two capacitors that are connected to one another through a series combination of three inductances, L1, L2, and L of B. Um, at the zero crossing moment of current, the capacitor C1, which is connected to the system, is charged to maximum voltage V peak. Um, so the two capacitors essentially um, form an oscillation until the voltage of both capacitors uh, reaches the same value. During that time, you have an LC circuit, um, which consists of a series inductance consisting of L1, L2, and LB. And then you have the equivalent series capacitance, which is C1, C2, divided by C1 plus C2. And hence, the uh, frequency of oscillation, let's call it omega 1, is going to be 1 over square root of L series C series. Once the two capacitors finish their oscillations with the inductances and they both end up with the same voltage, um, because the voltage of this capacitor is going to be the same as this value, uh, no current is going to flow through inductance L of B. Um, so I can assume that these capacitors are essentially one capacitor, one equivalent capacitor, which is the parallel combination of the two. Uh, so I can assume that this is more like L1 parallel with L2, but I can really ignore the strain inductances because they're pretty small. So what we really care about is uh, capacitors that are in parallel. And let's say CFP, which is going to be C1 plus C2. And then this is going to be connected to the source through an inductance L of S. Notice that um, here, enough time has passed so that I1 is no longer zero. So I cannot assume that the left side is disconnected from the right side anymore. This is a second resonance circuit um, whose frequency of oscillation is going to be one over square root of L of S. And I'm, I'm gonna ignore the strain inductances times C of P. Now, because C of P, which is C1 plus C2, is uh, greater than C of series in this case, and L of S is larger than the series inductance uh, 
uh, in the previous situation, what that means is omega-2 is going to be less than omega-1. So back-to-back -back capacitor switching consists of two transients, one which is, which is a faster transient with a frequency of omega-1, typically in the range of a few kilohertz, and a second one, which is a slow transient um, in the range of tens to hundreds of hertz. Uh, what you may see is, for example, if you look at a system voltage, you will have a very high oscillation, high frequency oscillation in voltage, and then followed by a lower frequency oscillation. When you see two oscillations that follow one another, one high frequency, one low frequency, that's typically indicative of back-to-back -back capacitor switching. What about when we switch off cap banks? Usually because we wait on to zero crossing of current, um, this does not really lead to any significant transients. However, one thing interesting that we may experience is the Ferranti effect. As a reminder, you probably from your machines courses or power system analysis courses, you remember that if I have a source V of S uh, that is connected to a load, which is capacitive, depending on um, system parameters, depending on how large this inductance is, if the capacitor is large enough, the voltage on the load side is going to be larger than the voltage on the source side. You probably remember this as, for instance, um, transformers that supply uh, capacitive loads may have negative voltage regulation, meaning that the load voltage is actually larger than uh, the voltage on the primary side. This is known as the Ferranti effect. Now let's consider this scenario. Imagine I have the situation as before. I have my source, I have my a source inductance and I have a capacitor. This capacitor has a voltage of V of C and between the capacitor and the source, I have an, a source inductance L of S. Let's say I have some stray inductance L of stray. Um, because of the Ferranti effect, uh, the voltage of this capacitor, um, which is going to be very close to the voltage that I am measuring here because that strain inductance is pretty small, that voltage is going to be larger than V of S. So it's going to have a slightly higher magnitude. When the capacitor is switched off, and let's say it's, it happens at the zero crossing of current, so I don't get any transients. When the uh, capacitor is switched off, all of a sudden the force that would have been pushing this voltage to be higher than V of S, all of a sudden that force goes away. And as a result, uh, this inductance with some stray capacitances does some resonance in order to go back to the source voltage. I have shown here in this diagram, this for example is the voltage at that point. Um, let's, let's, let's call it V2. So that's my V2. Um, and it has a magnitude which is uh, slightly larger than Vs. And the moment the capacitor is switched off, notice that Zero crossing of current means that the voltage is at, at a peak. So in this case, is it as a negative P. So the capacitor is, is going to have the voltage of a negative peak. And this, however, was higher than the peak of uh, the source voltage because of the Ferranti effect. So through some oscillation, I go back to the source voltage magnitude. That oscillation obviously is going to have a frequency of uh, L of S times C stray. So that's typically the event that you witness when you switch off a capacitor at a zero crossing of current. Um, there are some interesting phenomena that might happen uh, during this event, and we're going to talk about one of them here. Um, imagine the situation that I showed you on the previous slide, and for now, let's, let's ignore the uh, kind of the minor oscillation due to Ferranti effect. Let's say that everything uh, remains uh, very smooth and stable. The capacitor is switched off when its voltage is at negative peak and the source voltage continues going up. So here, the breaker um, that I had that would connect to the capacitor on one side and then the source on the other side is going to see two voltages, two different voltages across its terminals. On the source side, it's going to um, 
be seeing V of S the way I'm showing it here. On the load side or on the capacitor side, it's going to see voltage V of C. So the voltage that drops across the circuit breaker, let's call it V of circuit breaker, is a difference between the two. So as the voltage increases, notice that the capacitor voltage remains the same. The difference between the two increases. The difference increases. And let's say, hypothetically, when the system voltage reaches V peak, now the difference between this voltage and the voltage on the negative side is two times the V peak, or since I'm showing it with VFM, let's stick to VM. So two times VM. Um, an interesting thing happens that if the voltage that drops across the terminals of an open circuit breaker, if it exceeds the dielectric strength of the breaker, a restrike may happen. Restrike means that you're going to have an arc that will form between the contacts of the circuit breaker that are physically open, but they're going to connect through that arc. Let's say that restrike happens. It happens at this moment. When the restrike happens, recall that uh, the capacitor will pull the system voltage towards itself, in this case, minus Vm, and then we'll start oscillating with that magnitude uh, around the point of switching. The magnitude here is going to be 2Vm because it's the difference between Vm of the system voltage and minus Vm of the capacitor voltage. So you will have a, a transition from minus Vm to Vm, and then in the um, half a cycle, you basically go... Uh, 2 Vm over that. So you go all the way to 3 Vm. And of course, this will continue. And then you're going to have corresponding to that, you have oscillations in current as well. But notice that the contacts of the breaker are open. So let's assume that once this cosine function goes from negative peak to positive peak, which is half cycle, the corresponding current is going to go from zero crossing to another zero crossing. Now, let's say at the first zero crossing, so I had this arc, but when the current reaches zero, the arc extinguishes. When the arc extinguishes, the current, the voltage uh, across the capacitor is going to remain at three times Vm. This is going to remain at three times Vm, and it'll continue. So the system voltage will uh, go back to the sinusoidal waveform, and let's say continues this pattern. Now you have three times Vm. I'm going to kind of go into this diagram now. You have three times Vm, and then you reach minus Vm. And let's say hypothetically, at this moment, another restrike happens. Why? Because now the difference between the voltage of the positive terminal, which is minus Vm, and negative terminal of the circuit breaker, which is three times Vm, is four times Vm, four times the peak voltage. So if there is a restrike, again, the capacitor is going to pull the system voltage to its own voltage of three times Vm, and it's going to do another oscillation. But let's say for the sake of example, hypothetically, let's say when it gets to this peak, which now is, let's say, four times Vm and another four times Vm subtracted from minus Vm, so I'm going to be at minus five Vm. Let's say at this moment, the current crosses zero and the arc is extinguished. So now the capacitor is going to be left with a voltage of minus five times the peak voltage. This, of course, is more of a theoretical discussion because when the capacitor voltage, you know, reaches something close to even uh, two times the peak voltage, chances are that its dielectric is going to break down and it's going to have a short circuit internally. But at least in theory, these multiple restrikes are likely to happen each time that the difference between those voltages exceeds a certain level. We talked about capacitors. Let's shift our focus to loads. What happens when we disconnect loads? Similar to cap banks, we usually disconnect loads uh, at the moment of zero crossing. So we keep monitoring this, this current. When it reaches zero, we disconnect it. Um, typically, a load might be any combination of R and L and C. So here, I'm generally looking at it as, as an RLC load, uh, which means that the current and voltage are not necessarily in phase. So when your current uh, crosses zero, your voltage is not necessarily zero. So what that means is your capacitor is going to have some 
voltage across its terminals, which is not zero. And then that voltage is gonna discharge into the resistor and the inductance through a parallel resonance circuit. Uh, here I'm showing this diagram that your, your voltage, let's say when the current reaches zero, your voltage is somewhere here. So through that oscillation, the voltage goes back to zero, which means the capacitor fully discharges itself um, into the inductor. Um, if I am interested in the voltage that drops across the terminals of the circuit breaker, this voltage here, that VFCV, uh, recall that that's the uh, difference between the source side voltage and the load side voltage. And if I take this uh, voltage, subtract the sinusoidal from it, I'm going to get uh, this particular waveform. One of the things that could facilitate the breakdown of a dielectric of a circuit breaker is if I have a very, very high rate of rise, meaning that the voltage goes to a peak at a very, very fast pace. So that's typically one of the things that we have to calculate. Um, let's look into another kind of similar situation when you are opening not a load here, but a short circuit. So let's say I had a source of V of S um, and then source inductance L, a capacitor C, and there was a short circuit that I'm now opening it. Before I open this short circuit, the short uh, drops across the terminals of the capacitor. So the cap bank is going to be shorted as well, meaning that its voltage is going to be zero. Um, let's say I, uh, open the circuit breaker at the zero crossing of the current. In this case, this is going to happen uh, when the voltage is at peak, but the capacitor voltage is at zero. So it's going to be pulling the system voltage again once, once this breaker opens up. It's going to pull the system voltage towards zero, and then you're going to have an oscillation uh, until it damps out. Um, here again, notice that if I look at um, the voltage across the circuit breaker, this, by the way, is also known as transient recovery voltage, TRV. Um, when I look at that voltage, it's going to be going from zero to VM and then continue the journey until its own peak, which is now two times VM, and then it's going to come down. So during this time, which is kind of half a cycle, because one full cycle is going from here to here to here. When I'm looking at only going from the negative peak to the positive peak, that's a half cycle. During the half cycle, um, I experience a voltage difference of two times Vm. Now in this exercise, I would like you to calculate the rate of rise of that voltage uh, that drops across the circuit breaker. At this point, I would ask that you Pause the video, work through this. Once you're ready, uh, hit play to see the solution. Okay, so in the previous uh, diagram, uh, the frequency of oscillation between the inductor and capacitor obviously is going to be one over square root of LC. This means that the period of oscillation is going to be two pi divided by omega zero, which in this case is two pi square root of LC. Rate of rise, therefore, is going to be me going from uh, minus Vm uh, to Vm. You can look at it basically as an absolute value. Um, during um, half a cycle, T0 over 2, this is going to be 2 Vm divided by pi LC. If this is higher than the strength of the dielectric of the circuit breaker, you're going to have a restrike. Um, now, sometimes the short circuit is not as close to the source as I showed in the previous example, but rather it, it's kind of a few kilometers away from the circuit breaker location, meaning that between the fault location and the circuit breaker, we have some overhead line, some transmission line. Um, in a situation like that, uh, we have to be aware of the fact that the circuit breaker is going to see two different voltages. Recall that in the previous example, uh, 
um, on the source side, the circuit breaker would see the oscillations associated with the resonance circuit. On the, you know, a kind of a right side, it was a short circuit, so it would see zero. Here, on the other hand, it is not directly connected to the short circuit. Rather, it's connected to that short circuit through a transmission line. So on the source side, it's going to see the transient that we saw before. On the line side, however, things are different because once you open that circuit breaker, it's like a unit impulse that is applied to the system. And as we saw before, this is like a you know waveform that goes moves at the um, close to the speed of light to the end of the line. And let's say this is um, short circuited, so it's going to be returning with negative direction, negative polarity, gets to the terminal of the uh, circuit breaker, and as we saw before. The voltage when it gets to the uh, terminal of the uh, and and open circuit terminal, it's going to be uh, reflected with the same magnitude. So you're going to see twice that magnitude. So this is going to continue back and forth, especially if this is a short transmission line. You're going to see very quickly different copies of this uh, this voltage, which is going to be um, reflected with opposite polarities. So you will see the supplied side transient on the source side, you're going to see the line side transient on the uh, line side. And the difference between the two is the voltage experienced by the circuit breaker. And again, as before, you want to make sure this does not exceed the dielectric strength of the circuit breaker. One thing I mentioned um, several times today was that we open the circuit breaker at zero crossing of the current or close the circuit breaker at zero crossing of the current. That is true for high voltage applications and large loads. But in a lot of smaller scale applications, we don't have any means to keep monitoring uh, the current waveform to see when it crosses zero. Uh, consider, for example, when you uh, turn on or off an appliance in your house, you you don't really pay attention or you, you even you can't, do not have the means to know when the zero crossing occurs. You just, you know, open the circuit breaker, you disconnect the load. During that time, it is very, very likely that the current is not zero. And essentially when you open a circuit breaker, you're um, chopping that current to zero. We call that current suppression. There are so many examples of this. Typically when we have transformers that are under no load conditions, we disconnect them. We, we do current suppression or when we disconnect motors. Uh, operation of arc furnaces would be the same way. And uh, during this time, some interesting transients occur. Uh, let's consider this scenario, for example. Let's let's say that I have an unloaded transformer and I'm disconnecting it. Um, so when I was disconnecting it, this current was not zero. Hence, some non-zero current is going to be flowing through the inductor, for example. And because of that, there is some magnetic energy stored in the inductor that once I open the circuit breaker, it wants to uh, discharge itself into the capacitor. As part of this exercise, uh, I would like us to calculate what voltage I will be experiencing uh, on the capacitor if current suppression takes place. So again, as before, I'm gonna ask you to pause the video, uh, do the calculations, and then when you're ready, hit play. Okay, if uh, at the moment of uh, opening the circuit breaker, the current through the inductor is L0, that means the energy stored in the inductor is going to be 1 over L of M I0 squared. Um, this, of course, would have to eventually be converted into electrical energy um, and uh, transferred to the capacitor. So this energy becomes equal to one half of CV squared. And as a result, your V, the voltage, the maximum voltage experienced by the capacitor during those transients is going to be um, essentially square root of L of M over C times I zero. One very interesting observation you make here is that um, of course, the voltage experienced by the capacitor is a function of how much current we are chopping, we're suppressing. What is the magnitude of the capacitor? What is the magnitude of that inductor? But more important question is for you to look at the, this equation and ask yourself, 
what do I not see? What you do not see in this equation is any mention about the voltage of the system or the power level of the system. This means that in those situations, the oscillations on the capacitor would not be a function of system voltage. It doesn't matter if this is a 12 kV system, 600 volt system, 138 kV system, 240 kV system. Any system would um, basically experience an oscillation with that magnitude, which depends on, for the most part, the amount of current that you're chopping. The last event that we're going to talk about is uh, transformer inrush. Um, we have seen this before in a different context, uh, in the context of harmonics. We saw that when you um, have a transformer and you switch it on, um, you might have a wide variety of harmonics in the system. The reason for that is when you disconnect the transformer, when you switch it off, you might have some remnant residual flux uh, left in its core. Now, next time that you energize it, depending on the polarity of voltage, it is possible that the flux starts building up on top of that residual flux. So if, for example, you switch on the transformer in a half cycle in which flux is going to be increasing and in, uh, becoming more and more positive, then you're going to be pushed very, very deep into saturation. And as you know, during saturation, we're going to have very high currents flowing uh, through the transformer, which is also going to be highly polluted uh, with harmonics. Uh, these are a couple of good references for you to look into. The book by Santoso has a, a chapter dedicated to power system transients. Uh, the book by Greenwood is kind of a standard textbook for transients and power systems, um, and it has a lot of examples. So what we talked about today really is a limited number of examples of common transients and power systems. But if you're interested in knowing more, um, Greenwood has, uh, you know, um, a lot of examples and cases studies that you can study.